Amen. Good morning, Park Place. This morning, uh, we will be uh, partaking of communion for the first time in some time. Um, what we'll do first is we'll actually have the sermon, <clears throat> and then immediately following the sermon, uh, we'll uh, take communion as a family. Amen? Dear Father, we just thank you for this day. We are so grateful, God, that you have blessed us, each one of us, to be here with you, to meet you here, to hear your word, to sing songs of praise to you, to just thank you for who you are and for your faithfulness. Now, Lord, even as we have in obedience uh, gathered here today, we are asking, Lord, that you make your presence known, that you hear our prayers from our hearts, that you bless us with your word and that you help us to learn more about you and about your character and that you help us to be the people that can be a blessing to others. That even as we saw the video today, uh, there is a hunger around the world for you. And you said that we are to lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to lift up the example of your son, Jesus Christ. And as we do that, those hearts and minds will have an, an encounter with your son. So, Lord, today, bless us as we go into the word and we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus name. Amen. Today, <clears throat> we will be in Luke 8. Verse 43 and 48, and I'll give everyone a moment to uh, get to that passage of scripture. Very common passage of scripture. Uh, <clears throat> it allows us to actually experience um, a, a period of time with a person that was desperate. And I want you all to remember the word desperate. Okay? And it says, and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who toucheth me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people, for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I'd like to uh, speak today on the topic, Who Touched Me? Again, who touched me? As we see this uh, scripture, we are really uh, having an opportunity to examine a period of time that was very embarrassing for the person that is in the Bible here. You have to understand that with her having this particular condition, Mosaic law said that she couldn't touch anything. Mosaic law said that she had to be careful where she sat. This was a person that was an outcast in her society. And yet, it's amazing that even though she was an outcast in her society, her desire to be healed overcame her shame. And her desire to be made well overcame her fear. And so now we see that Jesus in his normal course of his day, his normal day to day along with his disciples is pushing through the, through the crowd. And as he pushes through the crowd, everyone is grabbing him Everyone is touching him. Everyone believes that as they touch him, that something will happen in their lives, that there will be a, a, a change in their life. Some of them, no doubt, were touching him and were, and were grabbing him because they had other people that had a need. They had other people that needed a, 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 a miracle from God. They needed a miracle from the Messiah. 
But what is so amazing about this scripture is that it was the touch of this particular woman that got his attention. The, the correlation that I want to draw on today is that every one of us need God. Every one of us need him in our lives. Every one of us need his, his time. We, we have things about us that we want addressed. But what is it about this particular woman that made her different than everyone else that was in the crowd? I would submit that it was her, it was her determination to go past whatever obstacle she faced to get to the blessing that she needed. See, the challenge that we have today is that sometimes it's not easy to get a breakthrough from God. Sometimes there are things that get in our way. And don't you know that for years we can pray for God to change something? For years we can pray for God to intervene. But there's always something that is in the way. There's always something that is blocking us. And so now we see this woman that just like every other day, I'm sure that she has tried to get to him. This particular day, the Bible says that she pressed through the crowd. Now, what does that mean? That means that on this particular day, she didn't care about whether or not people saw her. They knew her condition. They knew her condition because they knew that although they may not have known the extent of her condition, they knew that she was always on the outside. They knew that she was always distanced from everyone. But now suddenly you have this woman that is in the middle of everything. And, and what we gain from this is that there's a time in our lives where you just don't care that everybody knows that you're going through a struggle. <laughs> you don't care. You just don't care if everybody sees the weaknesses that you have. You don't care if everybody sees your fall. The only thing you care about is, am I getting to the one that can make a difference, that can make a change? You know, this, 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 this thing, that the, 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 the pathway that she went through in her mind and in her emotions is, am I willing to go to where I need to go to be blessed? That's where we are. Are we willing to do what we need to do to be blessed? Example, you know, the scripture says that we are to forgive one another. The scripture says that that in the way in which we forgive others, it's actually the measure in which God uses to forgive us. We understand that forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors is a cause and effect part of scripture. So as I forgive you, I'm forgiven. As, as I extend forgiveness to you, I am forgiven. Unforgiveness is a sickness. Unforgiveness is a disease. It is no different than the disease that we saw here in scripture. And I'm sure each one of us, as we look uh, throughout our lives, there are going to be some places where we have to be pretty honest with ourselves and say, I haven't forgiven that person. I haven't let that thing go. And we stand today just as sick as that woman in the Bible. It doesn't matter if it's our spouse. It doesn't matter if it's our children. It doesn't matter if it's another member of our church body. It doesn't matter if it's a neighbor. We stand just as sin sick as the woman in the Bible. And so the obstacle that we often go into is unforgiveness. Every time we think that we're going to feel a little better about that person, they'll do something else that we don't like. And the obstacle will get bigger. Is there anybody in here that can be transparent like me and say amen to that? You get to the place where you say, Jesus, I, you're on my side today. I think I can get past what they've done. And you and you muster up enough strength and you're pushing through this thing called unforgiveness to get to a place of forgiveness, which is our healing. And they do something else. And I'm sitting here and I'm smiling. I'm like, Lord, 
why are you putting me in this passage of scripture? Why are you parking me here? And as a preacher, I have to know that the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. So I'll just sit right here. We are sin sick. We are sin sick with unforgiveness. The Lord wants us to be one. He wants us to be unified. He wants us to be whole. And yet we allow unforgiveness to stand in the way of getting to Christ. This woman, the Bible said, had to press through it. She had to press through the crowd. She had to press through un, uh, the, the, uh, the ability of people to know that she was doing something out of the ordinary and it wasn't easy. And so sometimes we have to press through. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who hath loved me and gave himself for me. So what this scripture says is that Christ Jesus has died. He has been crucified. And we know as believers that he is risen. But the Bible says here, we've been crucified too. So the question is, are we able to really say that those things in us that Christ died for, that we've allowed him to crucify? Whether it is unforgiveness, whether it is uh, pride, whether it is um, anything at all that would come between us and the Savior. According to scripture, it says that as we are crucified in him, that we live. And so the Bible gives us a, an encouragement that tells us that as he deals with the issues and the problems in us, just like he dealt with the issue and the problem that that woman faced that day. And just as she was able to be made whole by her faith, we also are able to be made whole by our faith. We know that Jesus Christ being crucified set up a different system for us. And so the question is, what actually happened at the cross? When Jesus died, what died at the cross? Now we know in Galatians it says that he was crucified, meaning that he died and that he rose and we rose with him. But sometimes we have to look and say, well, what, what died? What, what died at the cross? What died at the cross was sin's ability to prevent us from pushing through when we need to, to get to him. That's what died at the cross. It is sin that stands as an obstacle between us and forgiveness for what he wants to, to give us. It is often our fear that stands between us and the cross. It stands between us and Christ Jesus. But because of his sacrifice, we are able to push through that fear. Sometimes it's guilt that stands between us and him. That is the crowd, if you want to use a metaphor, that stands in the way. We're guilty because we sometimes are wondering, will he forgive me? If I keep doing the same thing over and over again, if I keep having the same struggle over and over again, if I keep having inability to forgive and forget or to love past, will he continue to put up with me? Isn't that a question that we as Christians, that we as believers have to kind of ask ourselves sometimes, will he put up with me? But the word says, the scripture says that he will because he paid the price. And so now we have to understand that we have to accept all elements of Calvary. Today, as we are uh, later about to uh, accept communion, these are the elements of the cross. And so we know um, the, the sacrifice that he, that he um, went through for us. We know that he died for our sins. We know that he died so that we can be free. We know that he died so that we can have choice. Those are the elements of the cross. But the question is, have we accepted all elements of the cross? And I want to give you an example, just something to think about today. When Satan had the conversation with Eve, 
and Eve had her the conversation with Adam, that set up elements of what's called a covenant. There were elements of the covenant that were in place, and I'll discuss it here in just a moment. But the elements that were set up and put in place is the purpose that Christ Jesus had to come and to die for us. When we look in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. First element of that conversation. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, which means he introduced lying. That's the second element of that conversation. The first element was that God said, Don't do it. And it was challenged by Satan. The second element was, ye shall not surely die, meaning Satan introduced lying into the equation, which meant that if Eve and Adam were to accept the fruit, they exposed themselves to all of the lies of Satan from that point forward. Verse five, for God doth know that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Other elements introduces is your eyes shall be open. That was a lie. Their eyes were partially open, but their eyes were open to sin because they already knew righteousness. Ye shall be as God. Second lie. They were already made in his image and in his likeness. But because they accepted the lie that they wouldn't die, they suddenly exposed themselves to the second lie that they will be as God. And thirdly, knowing good and evil, exposing themselves to another lie because God had already given them a true knowledge of good, which by default let them know that they knew about evil. And so, as we look at this example, not just of the woman that had to press through the crowd, but also of what occurred in the garden, it again helps us to understand that the sin that we have in our lives from time to time, the unrighteousness that we have in our lives from time to time, Jesus Christ gave us a remedy. And today, the only thing that we have to do to take advantage of the remedy is to come to Jesus. It is to stretch out our faith. It is to believe that in, in regardless of the situations that we have to get through to get to him, that he has given us the strength and the ability to get to him, to believe that when we touch him, in other words, when we accept his word, when we believe what he has said, that everything about us that was sinful and everything about us that was against God and everything about us that was against his plan will suddenly be done away with. That is the faith that we have to have as Christians. God is calling us to a place where when we pray to him that we believe that he is a good God. He is calling us to a place that we dare to believe that he is the righteous father that he says that he is. He is calling us to a place that we truly believe that the power and the anointing and the free delivering power of the cross is just what Jesus Christ said it is. We see this woman who in her time of desperation and in her time of need dared to believe that if I touch his hem of his garment that everything will be okay. And we today stand as Christians with the same opportunity to allow our faith in our father to grow to another level in him. God wants us to step out on faith as never before as Christians and to extend this same faith to him, to believe that he is a good God. We saw him today expressed in the joy of the eyes of those children that were receiving gifts. We saw the love of God and the power of God and the anointing of God in those children. But guess what? We 
are like that to him. He is a good God. He is a good God. And through this sermon today and through this passage of scripture today, God destroys the lie of the garden that says that we shall die because through Jesus Christ, life has been introduced to us again. It is not just life as we take of the elements or partake of the elements. It is a daily understanding that I am crucified with him and now I live. That woman that made her way to Christ Jesus that day, in spite of everyone saying that there was no hope, in spite of 12 years of going to doctors and the doctor saying we can't help you, in spite of all the people that were standing around, I'm sure giving her recommendations, and telling her, well, why don't you try this? And why don't you do that? She suddenly realized, I don't want to talk to anyone else. I don't want to have a discussion with any other doctors. The only one, the only person that I want right now is Jesus Christ. People as of a, God, as a nation of believers, as, as a fellowship of the, of the cross, we have a responsibility to not only avail ourselves of this salvation that is extended through the word of God and through faith in his son, but to make it known to others. It is our responsibility to give hope to this nation, to give hope to our communities, to give hope to our families. There are areas in our lives where we have not allowed God in. There are places in our lives where he wants to be a part of us. He wants just the opportunity to, to heal us and to repair sometimes the stuff we've done, sometimes the places we've gone into and the things that we have done. Just like this woman in the Bible, we need to touch him. We need to get his attention, our faith, is the thing that gets it. And so today, as we are looking at this scripture and we're understanding that she had a plan B, we also have a plan B. <laughs> plan A is where we are now, dealing with our issues. She had an issue. You all have issues. I have issues. All God's children got issues. <laughs> So now let's everybody understand that we're all, all on the same playing field. I got issues, you got issues, all God's children got issues. She did too. The scripture is given to us to let us know he's got the answer. He's got the answer. The answer is pushing, back, push, pushing past a lack of faith and pushing past hopelessness and daring to believe. And that press that the scripture talks about is faith. God can deal with anything that we deal with today as individuals, as a church, in our spiritual lives. He can deal with it. We just got to let him in. And we got to not be afraid to let people see that he's all we want. When we get to the place where we don't care that people see that we love Jesus, you know, when we are in our day to day, when I was growing up, it was customary to say your, say your blessing. I think I probably would have got smacked in the back of the head if I didn't say my prayer before I ate. And now you see kids that are just eating without saying, thank you, Jesus, or Lord, thank you for this food. In my day, when I was growing up, it was customary for people to say, God bless you. And now it's like, you're like, well, you know what? If I say that, I'm going to get fired. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how, where we have gone to? But we have to get to a place where we're not ashamed. She had to be at a place where she said, I'm not ashamed. I'm going to push through if I need to push through. And the scripture says that there came a time where Jesus put her on the spot, not just her, but the entire crowd. Why did he do that? He did that because he wanted to give her an opportunity to overcome the shame, to overcome the fear, 
to actually get the full benefit of the healing that she had waited on. And she took that opportunity. So what should we do? We let people know, I love God. You can like it or not like it. You can talk about me or not talk about me. But my opportunity to reflect Jesus Christ, when you see me, I'm going to take it. That's what we learned from this scripture today. Dear Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Father God, for what you continue to do in us and how you teach us, Lord, to move closer to you, to not just say that we are Christians, but to live it, to allow your son to shine through us. And as we continue to allow your son to shine through us, you are glorified and people are blessed and we are blessed and made a blessing. We thank you for that today. Now, Father, as we move forward and we are remembering the sacrifice of your son at the cross, we're remembering, dear Lord, what he did for us. We're asking, Father, that you bless us as we remember it. And we thank you and we honor you today. The scripture says in Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29, it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. What we have here is a representation of that day. It's a, rep a representation of Christ Jesus having a last meal with the disciples before going to the cross and fulfilling his assignment. Scripture says that we are to remember this. And so today, if you will, there is a wafer on top. It's a clear seal. If you will, take the wafer from the top and I'll allow everyone an opportunity to do it. And don't feel bad if it's hard to get that off because it's it may be a little difficult. Scripture says, take, eat this. This is my body, if you will. Verse 28 says, or verse 27 says, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. If you will, please drink. <clears throat> 